There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, the slides are going to be available uh, by PDF. I'll provide a link to to those um, in the follow up email that you will get uh, tomorrow after the after the webinar. So, um, on the call with me today, I've got uh, Steve Dodd, who's uh, one of my solutions architects. Uh, he's kind of going to keep half an eye on the on the Q and A and the chat, and uh, let me know if my audio is problematic or anything like that. Um, I also have Alex Lemon from uh, AWS on the line, um, who will be able to answer any sort of AWS related account management questions that, that you might have. Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, I don't know if you want to unmic and introduce yourself briefly. Hi there. Yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much everyone for being able to join. Um, this is, uh, really put this together um, quite quickly. Um, you know, of course, everyone's you know very much now. Um, integrated into their work from home way of working and, uh, and of course this is really an opportunity to hopefully instill further best practices um, specifically today we're going to be focusing around um, uh, sort of those areas of um, cost optimization of course this is a time when we want to make sure we're scaling back where possible um, but also spending money in the correct areas um, and also then uh, as well you know John will talk about uh, areas of um, some of those uh, import importances of, of change. Um, so really, I'm sure a lot of you know me already, but I'm, I'm uh, Alex Emmons, uh, one of the account managers for the fintechs and uh, account manage probably a number of you on the call today. Um, but yeah, uh, of course, if there's any comments, uh, questions, then you're happy to answer those uh, at the end as well. Right. Thanks, Alex. Um, if you open the Q&A window, you should see people's questions as they come up as well. So you can, uh, uh, you, you have the, the permission on this call to, uh, to uh, to answer those as they as they happen, <coughs> so feel free to pitch in if anything comes up. Um, so let's uh, that's the sort of housekeeping bits uh, taken care of. Let's uh, let's talk about operating under uncertainty, which is uh, of course why you're all here. Um, I guess it's probably worth answering the who who the hell's this guy kind of question. Um, I'm the founder, CEO, CTO of the Scale Factory. Um, I've worked in hosting and infrastructure for about two decades at this point. Uh, initially, the the internet service provider world. Uh, and then sort of uh, more cloud things later on. Um, I am fully AWS certified, so you can uh, you can trust me as far as AWS is concerned, um, or at least I have a bit of paper to say that that is that is the case. Um, the Scale Factory, um, we're a an AWS advanced consulting partner. Um, we are uh, part of the Well Architected program. We were a launch partner for Well Architected. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, across the team, we've got 50 uh, or more AWS uh, certificates, so we're, we're all, uh, we all know what we're doing. Uh, we're also a Kubernetes certified service provider if you have any, uh, any Kubernetes and, and cloud native problems. Um, and we're also a, a G Cloud supplier, so if any of you are working in the public sector and you need um, help from a, a partner who is uh, on the G Cloud procurement framework, then um, we are available through that mechanism as well. Um, the uh, the team we're we're 19 strong right now. We're we're not a not a large team, so we're very happy working with startups. It's very much in our sort of ethos to be uh, to be working with uh, teams like yourselves. Um, and uh, pretty much all the team here is uh, is engineering or consultancy or solutions architecture. We we're pretty uh, efficient on on uh, administration and so forth. So uh, any one of these people could be helping you out with uh, with your AWS problems if we engage uh, after this uh, this webinar. Types of clients we've worked with, you recognise a couple of names on there. Obviously, Expedia and ITV bigger sort of enterprise customers, um, but also some smaller businesses there as well. You might see Songkick down the bottom. They were my first customer uh, when we set up the Scale Factory 11 years ago. Um, they were at that point a startup working out of a, um, uh, an apartment on Spitalfields Market and are now grown to a, to a much larger concern, ultimately being acquired by Warner Music. Um, the uh, the types of industries we've worked with are pretty broad as well. Um, we don't specialize in any particular industry area. Um, you can see that we've got uh, clients there in e-commerce, entertainment, media, finance, uh, healthcare, automotive. Uh, and we're familiar with a number of the uh, the compliance and regulatory regimes that um, exist within those landscapes as well. So we're, we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty experienced across the board, really. Uh, today we're going to be talking about you know what let's define uncertainty let's talk about what that actually is what that means um, and then we'll talk about how we manage the risk that that uncertainty introduces um, both sort of preemptively uh, in terms of good architectural choices um, but also sort of during operations through uh, through good operational thinking and good operational design um, 
given the the current climate, uh, obviously the main uh, sources of uncertainty right now is the uh, is the virus, the pandemic, and, and so we'll talk about some specific risks um, and specific uncertainties around that and how you can help to to mitigate those, um, and then we'll go on to a Q and A uh, later on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so no uh, no slide deck is complete without a stolen from Wikipedia definition of, uh, of one of the words included in the title. Um, uncertainty here defined as a state of limited knowledge where it's impossible to exactly describe the existing state, a future outcome, or more than one possible outcome. Um, and when we talk about uncertainty in sort of business terms or, or sort of infrastructural terms, um, really the types of uncertainty that we're talking about are um, things like economic uncertainty so what how will how will the current situation affect your funding uh, position like are, is you, are your investors backing out or are they they getting a bit shy of signing paperwork um what's the exchange rate doing is it more expensive to buy dollars at the moment and what what impact does that have on your on your business operations um there are some personnel uncertainties obviously right now the uh, the biggest risk uh, that we see is uh, people falling ill um from the from the virus um but you also have you know the uncertainty of potential for for personnel to to cause malicious uh, malicious damage to your your systems um maybe uh people with uh single points of failure knowledge in their heads resigning um possibly uh you know being being incapacitated for weeks at a time um uh, maybe even dying as a result of the uh, the the pandemic or or some other accidents like that those are those are uncertainty things that you need to consider um in your in the sort of uh, internet world you've got an uncertainty of demand um so that's to say you know how many how many uh, transactions are you going to have to be processing what sort of traffic are you seeing we've definitely seen traffic uh patterns change as a result of the the current situation um and uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure like there's, there's a, a number of pieces of uncertainty around there such as uh, whether resources are going to be available to you when you need them uh, maybe outages from individual service failures um, and you also have security related uncertainty so um, maybe you're carrying vulnerabilities that you don't know about and, and maybe uh, in future those will be exploited by bad actors um, so lots of uncertainty there and, and really what we're saying is that uncertainty is risk um, right and, and risk is is really uh, about existential threats to your business um, it's not necessarily the case that uncertainty and risk are all bad um, I think if you if you can adapt to uh, risk and uncertainty then uh, you can win out over a less adaptable competitor um, one good example of this that's sort of relevant to what we're talking about today is uh, is cloud adoption so in the early days of, of public cloud um, yes, adopting those uh, those platforms was a little risky at that point. That was a bit unknown, uh, not not well proven uh, back then. Um, you know, you had some some question marks around how it would perform and, and so forth. But uh, businesses that were comfortable with that level of risk were able to find that they they re were rewarded by that. Right? They they have uh, um, better ability to move quickly. Um, they don't have to go out and do sort of capital purchases of, of hardware. They they can uh, pay as they pay as they went that sort of thing. Um, so we're not necessarily saying that uncertainty and risk is is bad um but the the risk that we're talking about today or the uncertainty management that we're talking about today um we're going to concentrate on mitigating the bad risks um so that you can uh, continue to succeed uh, even in the face of that uncertainty so obviously there's a whole industry um geared up around risk management um and uh, you can read an awful lot about this on in very dry wikipedia articles or or papers about uh, iso standards and so forth but really it boils down to uh, that there's a the number of ways of treating risk um and uh, and they sort of boil down to those four categories really you can either avoid the risk or you can make choices that mean that you are not going to be affected by that risk at all um you can reduce the risk so you can look at uh, at the situation and make changes to mitigate the amount of risk you're exposing yourself to and this is what we're mostly going to cover today um there's also risk transfer so if you're buying insurance policies for example that's a, a clear uh, example of, of risk transfer um we won't really talk about insurance policies here but there are a couple of examples of risk transfer in, in what i'm going to talk about today um and then there's acceptance which is kind of you know just sucking it up and, and accepting that, that that risk might happen making sure that you you know um what impact that's going to have and, and that you are comfortable um with that level of of risk 
so in the in the AWS landscape and the the cloud landscape overall, um, there are two main ways in which we can reduce risk um, and increase our ability to cope with uncertainty, and those are um, good architectural choices, like making good design decisions um, early on, so that you are reducing risk with the choices that you make. Um, and a good operational approach, so putting time and effort into making sure that you are ready to deal with some of the things that might happen um, in an uncertain world. When we talk about uh, appropriate architectural choices, the main thing or the main piece of advice that I think um, I want to give is that uh, you should really leverage the platform. Um, and when I say leverage, I don't mean that in the sort of hand wavy kind of um, you know, David Brent sort of sense uh, leverage really is a, is a particularly defined term um, if you imagine a, an actual lever what you do is you put a small amount of effort in at one end and get a lot of results out at the other um, and when I talk about leveraging the AWS platform I'm talking about that the the, uh, the things provided by the platform um, allow you to with a small amount of efforts um, get uh, much more uh, much larger results than uh, than other approaches um, so across the AWS landscape you've got a, a vast number of different types of services um, covering everything from you know machine learning to blockchain um, to the, the more sort of uh, uh, less hypey things like databases and, and uh, compute and so forth um, I think that the general advice I'd give you here is that if you find yourself as an organization deploying software into the cloud that you haven't written yourself, um, then you might be making the wrong choice. There are probably service managed service versions of something uh, equivalent to what you're trying to deploy um, that will uh, get you most of the way to where you need to be without you also then having to take on the burden of operating this software. <clears throat> Let me give you a, a sort of worked example of this. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, with the concept of a Wardley map. Um, I'll walk you through uh, this if, if, if in case uh, not everyone is on the same page there. Um, a Wardley map shows on the um, on the uh, vertical axis axis um, is the value chain. So right at the top of the uh, of that graph um, is the customer. So that's the, the the person that you are delivering service to. Um, and as you get further down the graph um, or the map, um, you're getting further away from the customer and things are less visible uh, to the customer at that point. So um, this is a Wardley map for a uh, highly available MySQL database service. Uh, so the customer is interacting with MySQL, um, but those, um, the MySQL itself depends on things like compute and storage and monitoring and scripts to manage failover and so forth. Um, this really is sort of based on a 2009 kind of um, environment where you might be on premises deploying your own servers to make a, a database work so that your customers can use it. Um, going from left to right is the uh, is the evolution axis. Um, and over on the on the right hand side of things there are commodity. They're things that you can just buy from a from the commodity market. So networking and power are good examples of those. Um, you're not going to build a generator in order to uh, to run your your MySQL server. You're just going to plug into the national grid and you're going to get your power from there. Likewise networking you're going to buy that from a vendor. Over as you get further to the left um, you get to things that are um, more customized or, or custom to you um, such that over to the, the far left is the, the genesis area that those config management scripts um, because of where they sit on the evolution graph you're writing those you're responsible for putting the code together that makes those work so in general things um, in business uh, and certainly in technology trend towards the right of this graph so things that might have been sort of uh, something that you spend time on yourself writing code to make happen um, over a period of time become available as services provided to you as a commodity and priced as such um, so in 2009 you'd be writing your own config management scripts you might be customizing somebody else's uh, ha scripts and, and monitoring setup um, and you're buying your computer storage as a, as a product um, you're putting those in a data center that you're procuring on a sort of product basis and that data center is providing you with power and networking that is a commodity um, hopefully that's reasonably clear there's a, there's a level of complexity here is what I, I think I'm trying to get across here which is that in 2009 
if you were building a highly available MySQL database, a lot of the stuff on here you would be responsible for uh, for managing. Um, some of this stuff you'd be responsible for writing even. Um, and things that are further to the left of this diagram are, are more uncertain, uh, have a higher risk associated with them um, because they are essentially your responsibility. If we fast forward to today and look at the equivalent Wardley map for um, using a MySQL service, it's you can see much more straightforward. You now just consume RDS Aurora from Amazon, which is sold to you as a commodity. Um, as a result, your uh, your time and energy isn't spent writing copy management scripts or, or customizing uh, HA tooling. Um, all of that stuff is taken care of by AWS for you, um, and so your time is freed up to uh, to work on on your your business proposition. So when I talk about leveraging the platform, I'm really saying don't build as much stuff as you might be inclined to if you can buy it from somewhere else um, then that's probably the right answer particularly if that thing is not a differentiator in terms of how you uh, how you win business or, or how you 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 are acting in the, in the competitive market <clears throat> so this is sort of an example of risk transfer you're essentially paying amazon now for taking on the risk of managing the rds aurora uh, service um, and Yes, that's maybe slightly more expensive than uh, than doing it yourself, um, but the risk is now taken care of for you, which means that you can spend your own resources on on something else. And there's a whole plethora of, of the AWS stack that sort of um, has this benefit. This is a diagram called the um, shared responsibility diagram, which talks mainly about security actually, but um, in the in the case of uh, of this, what we're saying is that everything in the orange boxes at the bottom is somebody else's problem. Like the risk there is managed by and owned by AWS, and they can make certain assertions to you about availability and performance and and, uh, and other service levels um, that uh, that you can can trust. Um, things above the line are are then uh, things that you are yourself responsible. So your data is yours to manage, your application is yours to manage. Things like uh, client side encryption, and so forth, is all your responsibility. But the more stuff you can push down. Um, into the someone else's problem domain, um, the better because uh, the more time and energy that frees up from your team to, to do things that matter to your business. Um, so those are some good architectural choices to make. Um, the next kind of thing to consider in your architectural choices is designing for failure. Um, this is Werner, the uh, CTO of Amazon.com, uh, famously quoted as saying, everything fails all the time. Now, at first glance, that doesn't sound very reassuring if you're an Amazon customer. But it's like, yeah, everything's fucked. So it just doesn't work. Everything's broken. Um, realistically, though, this is this is really reassuring because it means that um, from, the, from the top of the organization down, uh, Amazon and AWS understand failure domains and failure modeling, and they can uh, provide you with the tools that you need to make good decisions to avoid particular failure scenarios uh, and know that some of those things have been well thought through and, and worked out. So on a basic, you know, straightforward level, you've probably seen this if you're already uh, uh, using AWS as a platform. Um, within a VPC, you have uh, multiple availability zones available to you. Um, the number of them depends on which uh, region you're in. Um, but in EU West 1, for example, here are three. Um, and uh, most services that are provided by AWS um, can be deployed into um, multiple of these uh, availability zones, either in an active active or a failover config. And if, as you're deploying your own applications, you can bear in mind those failure domains as well. Um, so as an example, this is the, uh, this is the Aurora diagram. Uh, sorry for the quality of that. It was much smaller on the web page I stole it from. Um, this is a, um, a demonstration that Aurora is, runs as a highly available service across multiple availability zones with read replicas, but that also work as a master-master setup. So in this, um, in this setup, um, there are for, for every piece of data you write into Aurora, um, there are six replicas created across those three availability zones. Um, and you only need four of those to exist to be confident that that data is kept. So you, the, you have a quorum of four. Um, the, it works multi-master. So if you lose an individual availability zone, um, then everything will keep working. And all of this um, has been 
um, formally proven either using things like TLA plus and, and other formal methods uh, within AWS to, for them to be able to say, we can guarantee you this level of availability and durability of your data. Um, and they are owning that risk and, and taking that responsibility on for you. Um, as long as you make the decision to use Aurora in a multi AZ uh, model. Going one level above that, if you're um, depending on, on your availability requirements, uh, you can also deploy your app into multiple regions um, and then use uh, Route 53 uh, DNS to, to route or balance traffic between them. Um, in that model, then you have to worry about, oh, sorry, my uh, I think my slide deck's crashed. Thank you very much, Keynote. Um, yeah, so your... Um, Depending on, on the availability requirements of your application, you can design your app in such a way that it will uh, span multiple regions. Uh, but then you have to worry yourself about how to move data around between uh, between those regions. So it becomes a bit more complex. But in the in the case where your availability requirements are very stringent, um, then you have to spend that time and energy on on, on making that happen. Um, so as a sort of overview of availability design, we've sort of talked briefly about clustering and failover. Um, we're going to talk about uh, auto scaling in a second. That's, a, that, that's both a, an elasticity as well as an availability consideration. Uh, we talked about multi-AZ and multi-region operation. Um, other things you can take care of in your architecture to, uh, to reduce the risk of your platform being taken out by uh, uncertain events. Um, and in caching at, uh, at the right layer, so that might be uh, using Redis or Memcache uh, from Elastic uh, from the Elasticache service, uh, or with uh, with CloudFront to do uh, web caching, or it might be a, you know an external service like Fastly or, or Cloudflare. Um, there's uh, if you can think about designing your application so that data is processed in an asynchronous fashion. Um, then uh, you are protected against certain types of outages. Um, that's a whole whole other topic for a, a, um, probably an entire uh, webinar in of itself. Um, and uh, building your services in such a way that they provide back pressure or, or, or circuit break in the event of um, problems. So um, in the case of a distributed system where you have multiple pieces of, of software all behaving together, um, Ideally, you don't want the failure of one system to take out the entirety of the infrastructure. So asynchronous processing and, uh, and circuit breaking can uh, allow bits of the application to fail gracefully whilst other parts can continue to run. Um, and again, that's a sort of uh, a deeper design topic that, uh, that we could get into in another, another webinar if you're interested. Um, designing for elasticity is, uh, is a way of coping with uncertainty. So, um, in this case, uncertainty of uh, of traffic, uncertainty of demand. Um, elasticity is the uh, the characteristic of uh, the platform changing size and shape in order to uh, to meet the, the demand that you have. Um, I've apparently left a <laughs> left another title in there. Um, this is the traditional um, diagram that AWS used years and years ago. I mean, you can tell that. It's got the old logo on there and has clouds in the background, which we almost never do anymore because that's such a massive cliche. Um, but in in this uh, this diagram is uh, is intended to to show what the difference between auto scaled infrastructure and sort of traditional data center infrastructure is. Um, and in this graph, we see that the, um, the the usage line here is marked out in red, um, and the blue line is uh, is the planned capacity. And so, in a data center, you probably buy a stack load of, of hardware from Dell every few months or something. Um, spend you know four weeks racking it and and powering it up and cabling it and installing operating systems on it. And other other things that we don't have to do anymore, thankfully. Um, the because the capacity sort of steps up in, in tranches like this, um, if your demand um, is under the capacity you provision, you've spent, essentially spent money on resources that you're not using. And if your customer demand uh, is higher than the amount of capacity you're providing, then you're essentially upsetting the customers uh, because you're not able to service their, their needs. So uh, designing for elasticity means that your, uh, your usage curve and your demand curve uh, so your, your demand curve and, and your, your pro provided infrastructure curve track each other um, so that you don't have any waste because you're not provisioning resources you don't need uh, and you're not upsetting the customers because there is always resource available to them. Um, and if you're designing correctly, um, 
your infrastructure can be functionally infinite as far as uh, most of your your workloads are like to be, to be concerned um, and uh, one such way of doing that uh, which is an, an analogy for all the other ways is auto scaling groups so in this model um, you've got a load balancer servicing these customers at the top um, that load balancer is balancing to an auto scaling group where uh, the size of that group is one um, and so uh, right now we have one server serving those uh, that customer demand um, an auto scaling group of one is actually not an unreasonable thing to do for uh, availability design uh, because if you lose that uh, that one host it will be brought back by the auto scaling group um, but it's more typical that you would uh, you provide more than one server in there um, and so you might for example uh, start to uh, see some higher level of demand so uh, you make n equal six uh, and then the platform will scale up your EC2 instances so that there are six of them following the rules of the, of the group, um, health check them, bring them into service, and then start serving demand that way. Um, then it may be the case that your customers are, uh, maybe that, that's how you serve your peak time. So a good example of that is Just Eat, who are obviously very, very busy at dinner times and, and not otherwise. Um, and so they scale up their infrastructure massively um, at dinner time and, and back again afterwards. Um, so afterwards you go, well, maybe we need three to service now and then the auto scanning group will, will pull those, those services down. Um, this example is, uh, is a, a traditional EC2 auto scanning group, um, but container, containers running in ECS, um, sorry, um, Fargate or, uh, or uh, EKS or something um, can all follow these models as well with the right rules. Um, and controlling scaling can be done on time on a time basis. So with just eat, they they know that they're going to get a lot more traffic at, at dinner time, um, and so they can scale up on a time envelope. Um, that is obviously great if you've got predictable traffic, but you can also scale up on metrics. So if you're starting to see a lot of requests, um, you can automatically scale that uh, that auto scaling group uh, along with. Uh, either sort of page response time or, or total number of, uh, of, of requests in a queue and so forth. Um, there's also more recently predictive auto scaling, which uses your historical traffic to predict um, how you are likely to need to scale today. Um, and that's a good sort of combination of the two, really. Let's talk now about um, operational approach. Um, so that was all sort of uh, architectural, really. Um, the main guidance I give for um, avoiding uncertainty uh, in operations really is to to look at adopting DevOps practices. Now we've been using the word DevOps ever since we set up the Scale Factory, so that's 11 years ago. Now it's still not very clear to everybody what that means. Um, I think in part it's because there is no um, there's no kind of DevOps manifesto that the way there was a, an Agile manifesto. So it does mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, uh, particularly tool vendors who will uh, suggest that you buy their tool to buy DevOps, which is obviously bullshit. Um, really the practices that I'm talking about as useful for, uh, for mitigation of risk here are infrastructure as code. So uh, adopting things like Terraform, Puppet, Pulumi, CloudFormation, those sorts of tools for um, expressing your desired infrastructure state as, uh, as software. Um, even now, um, you know, we, we, we review a lot of infrastructures um, every year, uh, and even now we're seeing that people are not always adopting infrastructure as code, um, even though that's, those are you know, tools that have been available for a long time. Um, it is worth doing if you're not doing that. Um, you can come and talk to us if, uh, if you'd like some guidance there. Um, deployment automation is the other one, so CI and CD, being able to release small batches of changes on an automated basis uh, and, uh, and do automated testing of those, those changes is a great way of mitigating risk. Uh, as long as your test suite is, is uh, adequate, then you can, uh, you can avoid pushing broken software into production uh, by running test suites on it. And monitoring and tracing uh, is surprising to me still how many organizations we find who don't have any kind of metric or log gathering uh, of the applications that they run, um, which means that they are um, flying blind a lot of the time. And you know, there's, there's, no, there's no point introducing more uncertainty by not providing telemetry for your applications. I think that's, uh, that's a pretty dangerous place to be. Um, thankfully, since 2009, there's been a lot of research uh, done uh, about the efficacy of DevOps practices. Um, this here from the State of DevOps report. Um, I think this table's from 2019. Um, 
the uh, the DevOps Research and Assessment Group, who are now a part of Google, um, are have run surveys for the last six or so years um, and used the data from there to, to demonstrate the impact of DevOps practices on um, software delivery performance, essentially, is what they're calling it. Um, and they've identified uh, different groups of, uh, of, of organizations based on the, their findings, um, elite, high, medium, and low performers. Um, and elite performers are capable of deploying uh multiple changes per day basically on demand um they uh they spend they take less than one day to release changes that have uh, been committed to source control into production um in the event of a service outage it takes less than an hour to uh, to return service to the platform um and uh, their change failure rates live somewhere between zero and 15%. So between zero and 15% of changes made cause faults of, and require remediation of some kind. Um, and you want to be an elite performer, basically. Um, that's what you want to be aiming at. And the, the DevOps practices that I just described all feed into that. Um, there is no way that you can have a an on-demand deployment frequency unless you have automated your CI and CD uh, tooling. Uh, likewise, lead time for changes. Um, time to restore service a lot of that is down to the architectural uh, choices that I've, I've mentioned previously um, some of it is also about um, being prepared for uh, outages and we'll talk about what that means in a second um, and uh, yeah change failure rate un unless you are taking steps to remove the chance for failure in your software delivery pipeline then of course you're going to start seeing faults in production and that's not what you want uh, for sure um, it's a really interesting read. There's also a book called Accelerate, which is um, uh, a way more detailed exploration of, of these uh, these pieces of information. Uh, and if, in case you're sort of mathematically minded, there's a bunch of uh, stuff at the back about the statistical methods that we use to, to come by that. Um, this is the only, I think, scientific peer-reviewed um, research of its nature uh, within the DevOps community. Um, but it is uh, at last now actual data and we no longer have to rely on the, uh, on the sort of dogmatic assumption that DevOps makes everything better. Um, it can be proven with numbers now. Um, so please do consider adopting those practices if you have not. Um, in terms of monitoring, um, things that you need to monitor, as I said, like if you're not monitoring this stuff, then you are introducing uncertainty to your life that you, uh, that you could avoid. Um, so monitoring user behavior, so understanding uh, what your users are doing, how they're using your website, uh, what, what sort of uh, API calls they're making, that sort of thing. Uh, resource usage, uh, so uh, what kind of uh, CPU, memory, uh, database, et cetera, requirements does that user behavior drive on the back end? Um, and, uh, and how does that resource usage compare to resource availability? Um, you can use that to drive some of the auto scaling behaviors that we described. Um, and also security controls. There are a number of, uh, of security um, characteristics to uh, AWS, uh, a lot of which I will be talking about in another webinar on the 22nd, uh, which is next week, I think. Um, and uh, a lot of these security tools also need to, to be hooked up to monitoring systems so that you can, uh, you can see what's going on in that landscape. Uh, so please do add monitoring if you don't have that because um, otherwise you are flying blind. So from an operations perspective, um, some of you might have, uh, have seen this sort of uh, terminology before. Um, this is attributed to, uh, to Rumsfeld, I believe, the uh, US uh, politician. Um, the, the basic premise is that within an environment, there are some things that are known knowns, right? So facts, things that you can point at and say, I know this to be true. Um, those are facts and requirements. Um, there are also unknown knowns. So there are things that you that you might know or that you might that your organization might know, but that that you don't necessarily know that you know. Um, there are known unknowns, so there are things that you that you know to be risks. Um, and there are unknown unknowns, which are things that you haven't even thought about, risks that exist that you have no, no potential concepts of. Um, and we treat each of these uh, quadrants differently when we're, when we're thinking about operations. <coughs> um, in the case of unknown knowns, um, if you've got um, things that are understood within your organization, but maybe are not 
broadly understood, then sort of brainstorming and, and group writing of documentation is a really good way of surfacing those things. And you'd be surprised at how many of those things exist in your business right now. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, often comes up during uh, during incidents or during an outage where uh, it turns out that Gary suddenly goes, oh yeah, but there's this limitation of this service or whatever. Gary knew that. If the rest of the team knew that, it could have been worked around already. So surfacing those unknown knowns are, is a really useful activity. Um, the known unknowns, um, so things that are known risks, you can build hypotheses about them. So um, one one risk that I uh, I like to use as an example, it's another MySQL example because uh, I'm old um, and come from a world where everything was LAMP. Um, the uh, the MySQL uh, MySQL error messages when they uh, when they come back to your uh, your MySQL library in your application, um, there are a number of different classes of error messages, and not all of them are actually fatal. Some of them are, "Hey, you were deadlocked on a transaction. You should try that again." Um, and almost nobody handles errors that way in their code uh, first time. Um, and when I when I tell you that, it becomes a known unknown. So if I were to ask you a question like, what happens to your application if MySQL returns an error code that says, hey, you can retry that if you like? Well, now you, you don't know that, right? So that you now know that you, ha that you don't know how your application behaves in that circumstance. So you can build a hypothesis about it. You can assume that it might not do the right thing. Um, you can go and test that uh, and you can iterate on that code until you do understand it and then you've made it a known known. Um, those are the sorts of things I'm talking about where you, we are sort of familiar with the, with the risks, but you don't really know how, the, they're going to, how your platform is going to respond. You can make assumptions about it, test those assumptions and then make changes to, uh, to improve the position. In terms of unknown unknowns, um, this is where a lot of the danger lies. I think a lot of, um, a lot of our consultancy work is, uh, is often helping teams know the things that they don't know. Um, and so that's why I had external consultancy there. Um, many of you on this call probably didn't know that about MySQL. Um, we've seen it a few times, therefore it's known to us so we can impart that knowledge and make it a known unknown for you. Um, but similarly research, um, you know, if you're using a piece of uh, software, um, like a, a, a data service of some sort, uh, and you, you don't really know what failure modes it has, um, researching into that can uncover those. So going looking in a manual um, at the at the sort of uh, the, the list of potential problems in the troubleshooting pages, uh, maybe going on uh, on GitHub and looking at the issues that are filed against it, those sorts of things. Um, that can be very time consuming, um, but uh, it's it's worth spending some time understanding those things. And really what you're trying to do with this exercise is, is moving known unknowns, unknown unknowns and unknown knowns into known knowns um, so that you are prepared for that eventuality. Um, so one thing that uh, that's a really good tool for, for doing some of this, um, this is uh, a run book dialogue sheet. This is from our friends at Skelton Thatcher. Um, another consultancy uh, who work in the sort of DevOps arena. Uh, Matt Skelton is the author of the uh, or co-author of the Team Topologies book that you might come across. Uh, worth a read if you are um, over a certain size where you might have multiple teams working together. Um, this dialogue sheet we've used on a number of occasions with clients uh, to surface the uh, the unknown knowns. So uh, if you as a team sit around this uh, this worksheet and work through it uh, in a sort of facilitated fashion, um, then you can capture information about a service uh, that might not exist centrally and turn it into documentation so it can live centrally. So here are things like, you know, what, what resources does this platform need? Um, at the top and upside down there is like, how do you deploy it? Um, you know, what, what's the, uh, uh, what are the what are the sanity checks that you might need to to run on a routine basis? How are logs rotated? Um, you know, which, which what does it do? Or what does this service even for? Who are the people responsible for it? How do I configure it? Those sorts of things often live in the minds of only one individual or one or two individuals, um, and need to be shared more widely um, for safe operation uh, in a, in a sort of uh, uncertain operational environment. Uh, and this is about planning for failure, really. Um, I think one of the things that we've discovered, uh, we've, we've reviewed a lot of uh, over 200 infrastructures at this point, I think, um, 
using the well architected review framework um which i'll talk a bit more about later um the the findings that we or the things that we found quite commonly across uh, organizations is that um they're not really thinking about failure they're they're not really doing any kind of planning for uh, things going wrong almost everything is happy path um and that that bites people eventually that becomes a problem um, early on in the startup life when you could bear to be you know out of action for four hours while you figure stuff out maybe that's fine but as you become a bit more grown up you need to to operationalize your platform a little better uh, and that involves doing some of this planning for failure so um building a list of potential failure scenarios by you know, working through um, every component to think about how it might go wrong um, so that you can understand how the platform's going to react to it. Again, kind of form some hypotheses, um, test those things, um, use those to guide your development activities, maybe put over a percentage of time to um, operational failure improvements um, in, in every sprint, um, thereby in increasing your understanding of the system and uh, and your ability to support it when things go wrong. Uh, you can run game days. Um, so if you're planning, if you've gone through this list of potential failures, you can on a tabletop basis, you know, sit around a desk, probably on Zoom now, to be honest, um, and choose a failure scenario and talk about, okay, what, what would happen if, if this went wrong? How would we know it had gone wrong? How would we respond to it? Um, and that sort of uh, activity will allow you to do all the thinking about failure up front, turn it into documentation, um, thereby ensuring that if that happens in future, um, you're already prepared because you've already thought about it. Um, and once you've got on top of some of that stuff and you're feeling confident about your uh, your architecture and your ability to respond to failures, actually running game days for real and, and doing live failure injection um, to see what happens and, and how people respond is, uh, is the way forward there. Um, a lot of people, when they're thinking about um, you know, failure domain modeling, will jump straight to that last game days bit and install something like uh, gremlin or or chaos monkey from uh, from netflix um and the only thing that happens if you try that without having first thought about it and uh, built a list of potential mitigations is you bring your site down like you don't learn anything new you just cause failure um so don't go straight there do the do the thinking up front even though that seems less fun um here's an example of a, a spreadsheet that we put together um, to identify the risks involved in a uh, in a launch of a, of a platform that uh, we were working on for a client, um, we this was a piece of work that we did ahead of a um, a large uh, media push, uh, media advertising push um, for a platform that had been built in in Django uh, and was run in Lambda for um, not the right reasons, but it turned out to work out okay. Um, we enumerated all of the things that could possibly go wrong. Uh, for each of the services that they were using, um, assess the likelihood and the impact of those things, um, assessed how we would observe that. So where where we didn't have monitoring for those conditions, we added monitoring so that we would understand when we'd hit that, that condition. Um, some steps on mitigation, so how we could work around it and avoid the risk entirely. Um, and also um, a runbook action for like, how you would go about solving that problem if it were to come up in production. Um, this was a the, the sort of main thrust of this spreadsheet took a day or two, I think, to put together. Um, writing the mitigation documentation and doing the, the sort of platform mitigations themselves took a bit longer, um, but we did that in order of priority. So we knocked down the, the high likelihood, high impact stuff um, first. Um, and as we got to the launch date, we were, we were more and more confident that we'd addressed the uh, uh, the, the risk that we'd identified. So this is a really good exercise, sort of thing that we, we as a team can facilitate with your teams, uh, if that's the sort of thing you'd like to work on. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a really fun way of learning way more about the things that you've built and testing assumptions that you have about how the platform works. Um, topically, or at least topically for, for 50 years ago, um, these are the uh, the Apollo 13 astronauts um, after they had uh, landed back safely back on Earth. Um, many of you may have seen the uh, the Apollo 13 film. Um, the, uh, the the details of that are are slightly embellished, as you might expect for Hollywood. Um, but the um, the general thrust of it is uh, is pretty accurate there. Um, basically, we, 
after 56 hours of, uh, of elapsed time in the mission, uh, they were doing a routine uh, operation to stir the cryogenic tanks um, as they, they sort of settle out in, in transit. Um, and uh, that exacerbated a, a manufacturing defect, which caused one of the oxygen tanks to explode. Um, and these guys um, limped back to Earth over the next four days, um, surviving by... Uh, using the lunar module as a lifeboat um, with some ingenious modifications to reduce power usage and and, uh, uh, and to stow urine and so forth um, and uh, in, increase uh, carbon dioxide scrubbing. Um, and the reason they got back safely wasn't really luck. I mean, there was a lot of luck involved, um, but but the, the thing that, that meant that these three men lived to tell the tale um, was that everything was written in check, checklists. The the, uh, the Apollo missions had binders and binders of these checklists, and they, they're pretty inscrutable. This one here is a, a checklist to transfer command service module guidance data to the lunar module guidance system. So as they uh, as they move from the command service module into the lunar module, um, they brought over um, data about where they were in the universe um, using this checklist. Um, so that they, they wouldn't uh, wouldn't get lost essentially, um, and there were loads more of these. And I, it, it's um, it is this week the fiftieth anniversary of uh, of that mission, and uh, there's a lot of there's a, a Twitter account that that is relaying the the the, the ground comms uh, that I've been following with a, a level of fascination, and it's really clear that the thing that uh, that's uh, that got them out of this mess was working through the checklist, writing these things in advance, simulating failure modes, like going to a simulator and trying stuff out. There are a few occasions where um, Jim Lovell, who's the, the commander, is saying to, to Capcom, oh yeah, just like we did in, in that simulation and such and such a time. Like they, they were prepared. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's not rocket science that that obviously was, but um, doing this on your own infrastructures, absolutely not. Um, it is just a case of spending the time doing this stuff. So um, writing run books and checklists, playbooks, um, the, this is your personnel um, risk mitigation. Um, you want to use this as an exercise to preserve institutional knowledge and, and centralize it in, a, in an understandable and, uh, uh, and current and accurate way. Um, if you can get your knowledge down into documentation, then you re reduce the burden on on specific key personnel. Um, we frequently find when we're talking with startups and, uh, and other smaller businesses uh, that they have the DevOps guy, but there's only one person who really knows anything about the, the operation of the platform. Um, and that's really risky, um, particularly in a, uh, in a landscape where you know, there is a virus that can kill people. Um, but in, in, in general, anyway, um, you know, any people can quit, they can fall ill, uh, they can be literally hit by a bus, which is the, the analogy we use. Um, but by documenting this stuff, you, you reduce your burden on those, those individuals. And it also, um, like I just talked about um, in, the, uh, in that spreadsheet and also the Apollo 13 uh, situation, um, designing those troubleshooting procedures in advance um, is really beneficial because it means that at four in the morning when everything's on fire or you know, two, of the two in the afternoon when you know, the, all the users are on the phone screaming about their data, um, you've already done most of the thinking that it would take to, to get the site back up and running. You can calmly follow the instructions you've already written for yourself um, knowing that you've, uh, you've already done the thinking. Um, so if you're going to start writing documentation, a, a lot of people worry about documentation because it feels like a really over-facing, time-consuming thing to do. Um, really, you can prioritize the most frequent procedures, so the things that happen most often. Um, I would hope that you, you have automated uh, software deployment mechanisms, but in the case where there are still manual steps involved, um, you're, you're probably going to be releasing software multiple times a week, and so documenting those procedures uh, makes sense. Um, documenting things that are more likely to go wrong um, is also useful. Um, so things that you have historically done and seen that they cause errors, um, writing those procedures up so that you can avoid those errors in future is really useful. Um, and anything that has a significant harmful impact, um, you know, maybe a database backup restoration or something of that, that nature, um, you probably want to, uh, to, to write that up so that you can avoid those, uh, those harmful impacts. Um, the things that you want to be documenting is the, is the bare minimum. Like you don't want to be writing big, big reams of paper uh, because ultimately these things are going to be followed in uh, emergency situations or during incidents. 
Um, and so you want to be documenting the, the steps of the procedure in as simple terms as you can. Uh, the outcomes that you expect from running those things. So where you're, where you're documenting command line operations, show what outputs you're expecting to see on the command line during a successful run or, uh, or things that might indicate failure. And document the escalation path. So know who you would contact about a, a specific fault um, if, you, uh, if you see it come up. Like the, there's, um, you're likely to be interacting with external APIs um, provided by other businesses. Um, your documentation should, uh, should document how to escalate a fault that you found that looks to be related to an API that you're consuming from somebody else to the people that provide that API. And, and you don't want to be scrabbling around in your email or, or otherwise trying to figure out how to raise those support tickets um, and in, in an incident uh, ideally you should be practicing uh, raising tickets with your suppliers uh, one of the things that we do as part of our support services is to, is to rehearse um, ticket raising with uh, with new members of staff so that they, they get a feel for how to ask for help so um, I've mentioned uh, the virus a few times uh, so far um, apologies if that's uh, upsetting to some of you uh, but let's talk about specifically the, uh, the, the considerations that, uh, that there may well be for you right now as a result of, uh, of the current situation. Um, so there's, there are considerations of cost. Um, and there's a lot of uh, economic uncertainty around at the moment. Um, some of you may have seen uh, your, your sales reduce uh, due to, to less traffic. Um, for a brief period of time, the dollar was way more expensive than it is now. Um, it, it's sort of evened out again now, but uh, the dollar exchange rate changing is a, um, it has an impact on, on the economics of your business for sure. Um, so the way that you can take action there is to, uh, to right size your workload. So we, we see when we're assessing infrastructures that often businesses are, have not chosen correctly sized um, uh, services for their workload um, they've chosen a really big instance type because that's easier than doing a load testing or or, uh, or figuring out or they choose a choose a big one and go well we'll go back and deal with that later um, and uh, if you look at the the monitoring that exists hopefully um, you can see whether or not the uh, the workload itself requires that size of, uh, of resource or whether there's waste involved and so changing the sizes of your instances or, or scaling down your databases, that those sorts of things will, will help to, uh, to, to right size that workload. And in an ideal world, if, you're, if, if you've been able to make those architectural decisions about elasticity, I was talking about earlier, um, then those uh, choices will have led you to a position where actually as your demand reduces and your sales reduce, your resource consumption is scaling back already. Um, one of our um, specialty areas is, is with the SaaS uh, sector, the ISV sector. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in, in the consultancy we do around that about um, making sure that you're only using resources when, uh, when customers are actually consuming your service. Um, and we can offer you some help with that if, if you need. Um, one other thing that's a really obvious way of saving money that um, not everybody necessarily thinks of or, or has put the effort into um, is something called a pilot light deployment of your development environments. Um, a pilot light deployment, uh, similar to your, you know, your gas boiler, for example, um, what we do is scale back all your compute nodes maybe pause your pause your database service and that sort of stuff on a time basis so um, outside of office hours over the weekends on holidays um, you're not actually using uh, the dev environments uh, they get turned off uh, and we call it pilot light because there are still some things that might still run so your databases might still uh, still run or you, you certainly might keep the storage for your databases around um, so that when you uh, when you light the boiler properly first thing in the morning um, everything behaves the way you'd expect um, that's also a really good way of, uh, of testing your automation uh, your automated server deployments as well if they're coming up and down every day um, then that stuff gets exercised and you find problems with those much earlier um, you can save a lot of money by, by doing that um, I haven't added to this list because I, I don't know if now is the right time to be doing this but um, there's also uh, things like reserved instance or, or uh, savings plan spends as well um, if you know that you're going to have a, a specific uh, resource requirement for a period of time uh, you can buy you essentially reserve capacity 
uh, from AWS by spending money up front to get a, a reduced cost in the long term. Uh, you can save up to 70% or uh, something like that with, with uh, savings plans in, in certain cases. So that might be worth uh, investigating. Um, in terms of demand considerations, um, within the uh, the current environment, we've definitely seen um, businesses in the education and entertainment sectors are seeing way more traffic, obviously, um, because they're uh, they're now supporting a, a, an audience that is trying to educate their kids um, and uh, entertain themselves while they're while they're in lockdown. Um, it's uh, it's likely that they're much busier now. Um, there are businesses that will get busier in future um, at the point at which we are no longer in lockdown. Um, things like travel, booking websites, I think we're going to see uh, big increases in, in demand for. Um, so the action you can take if, those, if either of these affect you, um, doing some load testing, so um, actually doing some simulated uh, uh, traffic and, and seeing how your, your site responds resizing instances you know tuning things so that they uh, so that they work well at that new load um is something that you can do <coughs> the uh, the work i mentioned earlier with the um with the risk spreadsheet uh, we did a good deal of load testing and performance tuning ahead of their uh, their their launch as well um in order to make sure they could sustain that demand so if, if you're in one of those sectors um you should be thinking about uh, future load testing um and performance tuning to to deal with that Excuse me. Um, in terms of personnel considerations, um, I think that this is this is top of mind for a lot of us. I, I know um, we we uh, make an effort to take good care of our people, um, and so we, we're sort of constantly worried about how uh, how everybody is. Um, the the type of impact you might see on your personnel that there is a a, a strong likelihood of uh, of sustained illness um, with the virus, possibly death as well. Um, we don't like to talk about that, but you know this this does have a uh, have a um, a high mortality rate compared to other things that we've seen before. Um, we're also seeing um, you know with, with our team certainly that those those of us who have kids are. Um, less able to to be around or or to focus um, because they're they're uh, they're doing homeschooling or, or otherwise taking care of people, uh, not just kids. Obviously, you know people with elderly parents or or other dependents will also be affected by this. Um, so uh, you are almost certainly right now experiencing personnel um, risk right now. Um, the action you can take, the, the type of documentation and knowledge sharing I've just talked about, is a, is a good thing to be doing, uh, particularly if you rely on a single individual to to do your operations, or or if there's there's one person who's always the go-to guy for answering questions about the platform. Um, every business has one. Um, you know, be, be be careful with that individual. Make sure that they are uh, they're sharing that knowledge and and that other people can can do the same same things. Um, you might want to consider increasing the team size. Um, you know, if you if you're financially able to do that, maybe uh, adding a adding a second individual. Um, I think now is probably a good time to be hiring. Um, I know a lot of businesses have, have had to jettison staff as a result of uh, uh, of this situation. So uh, it may well be that there are people on the market you can hire uh, pretty quickly if you need. Um, and then there's the third party. Um, option as well obviously I, I say this with a degree of nepotism because uh, we uh, we do nepotism no uh, mercenary mercenariness um, we uh, we have a support uh, offering where we are available to businesses to provide um, sort of escalation of uh, of support issues around the AWS platform and, uh, and applications um, and on a number of occasions we've taken on those support contracts because um, a business is uh, is losing an individual and so we go in early do that documentation and knowledge share get that information out of their heads before they leave um, and then we're, we're available to provide that continuity uh, as well as being uh, around for a 24 7 kind of support basis uh, available on slack during the day for asking questions um, surgery hours and training and that sort of thing so if you'd like to know more i can talk talk more about that um one thing you might consider doing um, now um, is uh, is to have a well-architected review performed. Um, we at the Scale Factory are a leading partner in the well-architected program. Uh, we've, we've reviewed over 200 workloads um, since April 2018 when we joined the joined the program. Um, we um, we got a lot of experience in identifying common problems and and uh, recommending uh, workarounds or, or uh, risk mitigations. So. Uh, You'll get a lot of value from that. Um, 
the other benefits to working with us on on well architected is that uh, there are funding programs available uh, as part of that so if you use us to uh, to review your workload and then book uh, improvement work with us uh, whether that's consultancy or support or um or uh, training or, or uh, any other type of activity um, then AWS will give to you five thousand dollars in credits for uh, AWS services uh, that will offset the the cash cost of the of the work that we do for you uh, we can claim that five thousand dollars on a per workload basis so if you run for example an e-commerce platform and you have a separate uh, BI and big data uh, stack that is uh, that, that sort of provides analytics for that. Those are two separate workloads, and that funding is available twice in that case. Um, there's a URL there. Um, I'll also be sending out a URL to that um, in the uh, follow-up email that uh, that will come uh, to you tomorrow uh, once the the webinar is wrapped up. Um, the review uh, takes about half a day. Um, there are about sixty questions involved, uh, maybe more if if you are using serverless or you're doing high performance computer or anything of that nature. Um, and we cover operations as a consideration. We get into security, um, performance, and reliability are both considerations, and also cost management. So um, you may find if you're if you're worried about um, your current infrastructure costs, um, bringing us in to do a do a well architected review and then using that five thousand dollars to fund uh, some cost optimization work is a is a good option. Um, we've done that for for a number of businesses this year, um, and usually found uh, found some ways of, of saving some money, uh, particularly if their existing spend is kind of over about five thousand dollars a month. Um, that's it for for the me talking at you section um i will take some questions if anybody has any but i i haven't seen any pop, any pop up in the uh, in the q a section there um i'll give you a a minute or so to uh, type frantically if there's anything that you uh, that you desperately want to know now just want to say thanks john for being able to uh, to run through that i hope that's been useful to uh, reiterate or to educate some of those architecture best practices um sort of across the whole platform there i appreciate that we're a few minutes past so thanks very much guys for being a, uh, you know folks on the call for being able to um, just uh, hold on for a little bit longer there um just to uh, hear some of those really interesting last points especially around things like the well architects review um I, I sort of keep my piece short, but just wanted to say, you know, thanks very much everyone for joining. Um, you know, please reach out to your account manager, um, you know, directly to discuss more of some of these areas. Um, again, you know, we work very closely with Scale Factor as an advanced consulting partner. So, um, you know, we can engage with them as well around a number of things, especially that well-architected review, which is a great opportunity now to be able to, you know, help to understand, you know, what areas are key to focus on, um, you know, helping to prepare for, um, and manage that change. Um, you know, just one one point on that cost optimization piece. Um, there is, of course, the no upfront options uh, as well. So, you know, you could hold on to that cash, which is very important right now, but still able to, able to take advantage of the uh, savings that you have there across savings plans and reserved instances. So, again, speak to your account manager about those. Um, you know, and again, you know, uh, just you know, just to say is that, you know, we are, um, you know, we're here to help you guys to, uh, you know, continue being successful and achieve your, your mission and goals, um, you know, especially as three quite unique times, um, you know, so if there's any resources um, that, that you may need help with, um, guidance, support, um, again, those the labs as well, um, you know, we, we do those within AWS, so can provide support um, around those, um, as well as other cost optimization areas like POC credits for projects that you may be working on. So again, speak to your account manager about that. But um, uh, I think there's one question from Tom making in the chat there. So um, yeah. uh, I'll pass over to Steve or John. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate everyone for joining. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I, I think I put 90 minutes in for this uh, this webinar, so I, I think okay. we're still I think we're still on time. If okay. I didn't, I, I apologise. Thank, and thanks for sticking around. Um, yeah. So Tom uh, is asking: uh, Serverless hosting platforms like Lambda seem ideal for delegating as much responsibility as possible to the cloud provider. In the context of risk, what is the downside of fully serverless versus auto scaling groups? Um, yeah. So you're you're right there, Tom, in that. Um, that Lambda is uh, is probably the or the serverless in general um, is the best way of delegating as much responsibility as possible down to down to the provider, um, and p particularly my I think my favourite thing about the, the the more serverless offerings and we I think. Um, 
This is controversial outside of the AWS world, but AWS would consider things like Fargate to also be serverless uh, because you yourself are not running the operating system that that um, that sits on there, uh, and you're not having to provision whole servers. Um, they'd also think, I think, of uh, uh, Aurora and those sorts of things as serverless. So serverless is a sort of broad, uh, broad description of things. Um, but the um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the the benefits of uh, serverless, I, I I like the fact that you don't have to patch any any operating system components, right? It's giving giving a lot of additional responsibility to AWS, which means that your traditional kind of janitorial sysadmin tasks are not yours to run anymore, uh, which means that your your team can be providing way more value. In terms of risks, um, let let's look at risk particularly Lambda versus running an autoscaling group of EC2 instances. Um, in the EC2 world, um, you would have to run an AMI uh, with an operating system on it. You'd have to patch, provide patches for those. Um, you'd have to, uh, to to do all that kind of server management stuff. Uh, if you adopt Lambda, that's all taken care of for you. Um, the thing that we've seen as risky with Lambda is um, that complexity can spiral out of control a little bit like the the in an ideal world your lambdas are all providing small self-contained functions um, rather than kind of big monolithic application components and so at that point you're suddenly um, definitely dealing with a distributed system um, and distributed systems are hard uh, and actually much harder than a lot of people would would think um, and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of additional architectural work that you have to do up front to do a good job of building out a lambda um, the other thing that uh, that you need to be worried about in the lambda lambda world is um, uh, tracing and, and telemetry. So um, you a lot of the time, if you're running an EC2, uh, if you're running apps on EC2 instances, you can sort of get away with being shitty at logs and monitoring because you can just log into the box and look at what's running on the system you have no such luxury in the lambda world and so you definitely have to glue it up with uh, cloudwatch logs x-ray for telemetry um the risk there pay or the, the time there pays off because what if you've ever seen a, an x-ray trace um you'll wonder how you live without tracing uh, ever in, in any of your applications um there are other considerations with Lambda around uh, performance, which I think are, are less of a concern now, um, but depending on how you glue your Lambdas together, um, you know, if, if architecturally you have one Lambda calling another Lambda, and that Lambda calling other Lambdas, um, you end up with a, with a pretty slow application. So you have to think more asynchronously. So I think the, the risk is that you end up having to do more design, um, but I think the outcomes are often worth it. Um, but barreling into a, into a fully serverless you know, Lambda deployment of your application um, is likely to get you unstuck unless you do some research on how to build distributed systems well. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Steve, from your, uh, your experience and perspective. Um, no, I think that's most. What well, one thing that um, has come up actually in a well-architected route um, recently is um, one of um, our customers are using a version of um, Node that is going end of life in Lambda soon. Um, so they are um, having to upgrade their Lambdas. Um, so there is obviously the risk that you need to keep up to date, but that's not a risk in itself because you should should be using the latest version of these these runtimes. So yeah, this is just another thing to consider that's come up recently. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I think the the um, the burden of uh, of management of individual lambdas is way lower than of whole operating systems, but there is still a bit of burden. You also, of course, have to make sure that you're upgrading your uh, your library dependencies and everything else uh, in, the, in the same way. Um, so thank, thanks for the question, Tom. Um, if you'd like to talk about that in more detail, do drop us a, an email and we'll uh, uh, we can, uh, arrange a call to, to chat about it some more. Um, one question from an anonymous attendee, uh, can you recommend or reference any security processes slash practices which are particularly relevant in a crisis like this, uh, e.g. credential management slash revocation. Um, I guess nothing, I, I don't think there is anything um, security related um, 
that is more relevant right now than it was before the um, the COVID situation kicked off. I think um, good security practice and processes are, are generally good security practices and processes. Most businesses that we review are kind of bad at them, um, unless they're within a, a compliance uh, environment like fintech or uh, or pharmaceuticals or you know health or whatever. Um, I think um, you mentioned credential management revocation. Yeah, that's definitely a good one. I think the one of the concerns that you might uh, worry about if you've just moved from being in an office to not in an office, um, if you were relying on security controls that um, related to, for example, site to site VPN from your office network into your uh, into your VPC, um, or or otherwise made assumptions about the fact that your office network was trusted, um, then you will probably need to worry about how you manage that on a per device basis. Um, I mean, my recommendation for a while and, and what we do in our own office is to, to treat our office network as though it's a Starbucks network. Um, there, there is no, nothing on our, on our office network in terms of like Wi-Fi and end user devices um, is at all privileged versus our home networks or a, or a coffee shop. <clears throat> and so building good um, security stories around remote access um, and, uh, and device identity and stuff um, is a good idea anyway. Um, but that, that I think is probably the, the thing that, that a number of businesses are probably struggling with right now. I've definitely spoken to some who um, at the very last minute were setting up things like AWS Workspaces, which is a, a remote desktop um, platform to allow um, their less technically skilled users to get at um, privileged resources from home laptops um without uh, exposing those resources to to risk um i think uh, probably a lot of that stuff has, has been taken care of by now but um we can certainly help you uh, consider those things if uh, if that is a, a concern but the the well architected review covers a lot of security practice um we often find um a reasonable amount of deficiency in 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 practice so um, if you are concerned about security processes, um, uh, particularly now, um, then uh, book a well architected review with us and call out specifically that you're interested in talking about security, um, and we'll make sure that we do a, a more security focused uh, conversation with you. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Any more for any more? No, I think we're all good there. So um, thanks for your time, everyone. Um, we, can, uh, we can stay in touch. Uh, you can email me, john at scalefactory.com. Um, you can obviously find us on the web. We're also on Twitter. Um, if, you, uh, if you check your email tomorrow, uh, you'll get an automated mail from Zoom just to sort of uh, close off the, uh, uh, this, uh, this webinar. I, I believe it'll reference the, the recording. Uh, of this content um, if not uh, drop me an email I'll, I'll provide you with a link to that um, if you are interested in seeing the slides in PDF form again uh, drop me an email I'll, I'll send you a, a copy of the slides uh, if that's not also uh, includable in, in that email um, do book a well architected review if you haven't had one before um, you know, the the activity is cost neutral to you and it's a it's a great way of uh, of benchmarking how you've uh, how you're doing uh, with the platform um, and uh, please do get in touch if there is anything else we can help you with um, thank you for your time and attention today it's been uh, it's been a pleasure <laughs>